Hello, I'm Jan English Lewick. This YouTube video series profiles workplace anthropologists whose work directly influence their own workplace processes. The video series is part of a workshop in the Business Anthropology Matters Initiative. As people increasingly spend their waking hours at workplaces, anthropologists need to understand those experiences. The practitioners profiled here have used anthropological skills to access, document, analyze, and relate the lives of workers and the businesses that employ them. Organizations employ anthropologists to understand a variety of worker-related issues within organizations, ranging from design to strategy. These interviews explore the practical, theoretical, and ethical issues that must be resolved to do workplace anthropology. Um, my background is anthropology. As, I, as you know, I did my PhD in Edinburgh. My focus was um, communication and teamwork in high-risk environments. Um, and I started then working um, at Swisscom. Um, soon after working, I took over the lead of what we would call a sort of a user research team. So we weren't doing design, we were doing really sort of basic research. We were within the R&D department. So we were helping them do sort of need-based innovation rather than product, you know, or, or uh, technology-based innovation. <clears throat> um, so that was purely working in the organization. That was all external studies with fir large firms, small firms, private, you know, uh, what we call residential customers. You know, what do they do? How do they behave? What do they need? You know, how can we address those? <clears throat> um, and then I started moving in the direction of strategy. So do so combining what we would do as is typical before you go into the field, you do as much of a contextual, you know, you learn as much about the context as you can. So um, at some point I started saying, hey, we need to, to be including suppositions, ideas, predictions, just bullshit about the future in the context that we're generating because it's important or the value for our firm goes up um, when we make riskier um, statements like not just what we've seen but what we think that means and where we think that actually could be developing. So we started including sort of a future focus in the context, contextual stuff we were doing pre-research, pre-field studies. Um, and then I, and then after pretty close collaboration with, with strategists and strategy projects for a couple of years, um, then I moved really, uh, very, clo uh, very closely. I mean, now I'm actually a part of group strategy. I actually dropped the lead of the team. Um, and I've moved myself or this mandate, which is a, which is a, a version of corporate foresight, probably is the closest box you can put it in. Um, it's not foresight based on, it's not quantitative stuff, it's really qualitative, concrete, and really human-focused foresight. So it's mixed with technology, but it's not a tech radar, it's not a business radar. It's really, you know, tr tracking the way that we, that needs and expectations and behaviors are changing right here. Along the way, so along the way when we were, when I was leading a team that was still doing projects for different sponsors within the firm, we did do some projects for HR. We helped them to reevaluate um, their performance, what they call performance management. Um, we helped um, mm, mm, mm. we helped them discover that they that they actually do have customers within the firm and um, you know, to think about taking a customer-based approach to, <laughs> sounds kind of, you know, painfully obvious, but to help them take a customer-based approach to delivering services rather than sort of a, what I call the process-based approach. You know, um, processes are important and there are no customers for them. So, but that's pretty, but it's pretty, that's what, that's what I have off the top of my head in terms of working with the organization. I've, I've basically been strongly positioned in innovation and now in strategy and sort of delivering a view, a particular view on, on the, 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 um, the few, where our customers or users stand, both private and firm and business customers, where they stand, what, what we can, what forces are influencing their behavior, are changing their expectations, 
know, what areas that's accelerating, what we can expect over the next couple of years. Generating product, uh, you know, insights for product development is a long, there's a long, long, there's an established uh, tradition of doing that, you know, with qualitative user, you know, uh, re qualitative research approaches. But I don't know anybody, I really don't know anybody um, who's working in a firm who's, who's using the kind of data sets I am to, um, you know, um, influence strategic decision making. I don't know anybody. So, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a tough, um, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an e, uh, it's not a mindset, but it's a pretty strategists know that they're the smartest guys in the firm and they know that they know, you know, they know that they have all the right answers. They know that they know enough. They know that they know everything they need to know. So it's, <clears throat> it's not particularly easy. You know, it's not particularly open to, to other, um, points of view. They're, they're, they're generally traded, you know, they, they see a lot of noise around them, but their mindset, their worldview, their work view, um, is very, they are very confident in their methods. They're very, they're a hundred percent convinced that, um, it requires that an, an analytical exercise will bring you to the answers you need. So that's a very, um, and they're confident that they, they'll come up with the answers you need. So, and that's a different, you know, the, the way that the, the, both anthropology and chunks of sociology and social psych as well have a much more humble starting point, you know, as you just pointed out. So, um, <clears throat> that makes, um, so that's, that makes it, I think a little bit of a, um, on the, on the, on the level of discipline, I think it makes it a little bit of a, no, I don't think it's a bit of a barrier to get in there. So what, 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 um, has happened, you know, my path, uh, went over, well, it went in two ways actually, but now this is a different direction and you can stop me whenever you want, but it went in two ways. Um, I wanted to say it went over relationships, but that wasn't really true. What it, it went, you know, at a couple different points, strategists were in need and they had two options basically within our firm. <clears throat> they, you know, they were in need, um, one was, I mean, a few years ago, you know, they needed something about the, they needed something about the customer that they couldn't get for themselves. And they had two options. One was market research and one was me. So, and I'll never forget the meeting. We were there. I was there with a strategy, with a head of a strategy team and a market research person. I was there and one other person from my team. And basically, and you know, this guy, the, the, the head of strategy described what he needed. Uh, and the market researcher said, well, um, I've got answers to this question and I've got answers to this question and I've got answers, you know, basically she showed about 12 different tiny little slivers of human behavior or thinking that she said, I've got an answer to. And then basically I said, um, I don't have anything that deep, but I've watched enough of, I've observed enough of these people in their own settings to be able to put everything together. And this is of course what strategy, so, I mean, I said it in slightly different words, but you know, I basically, that's basically what I was saying. <clears throat> and this is what strategy in this instant needed. They didn't need, you know, they, they needed, they needed to be given the human context of what they wanted to explore. Cause the strategic decisions have, have a, but in my experience, have a bunch of factors, um, profit, profitability, you know, what's go, markets and competitions, profitability, our own assets. Can we do that? Does it fit with our positioning as a brand, as a firm? Um, is it relevant for the customer or user is somewhere in there, but I would say, depends on the topic, maybe on some, to some, some topics, it's maybe 25% of a decision and others it's, it's much less. Um, but, but that was an important, so that was an important point where they were sort of forced to take what I was offering, but it was very clear that, the, uh, that what I was offering or what this approach offers, um, it was much closer to what they needed than, a, you know, a very, t a ver a very t narrow slices of information, um, <clears throat> about, 
answering specific questions, but without that you couldn't really without the context needed to, to make sense for them. So, um, and then it was just, that was just a moment that's probably just more specific to my story. Um, but I, <clears throat> but it's a matter of, of being sort of customer oriented, not just vis-a-vis -vis external customers, but vis-a-vis -vis every single person you deliver to. And when I took over the lead of the team that I worked in for two years, one of the first things I did to start changing the way we worked was I said, from now on, we don't collaborate with, we have internal customers. We don't, they're not just collaborators or whatever, you know, they're nice words in German that basically mean, you know, something like that. I said, now we, from now on, we call them internal customers. So our relationship is we deliver what they need. You know, we deliver value to them. There was a bunch of resistance in the team interestingly from some people um but that you know being rigorous about that mindset led us and led me to understanding more or less exactly what strategists need at what time uh and then being able then adjusting what i do in order to be able to deliver what they need and and it's a now i think the relationship with strategy is my relationship with the strategist even before i moved into their team is 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 perfect yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's really good. When, when one of them leaves, there's always a handover with the guy who comes in. So this is, you know, we take an hour, this is Tom, these are the things he does, these are the things he can deliver. And if you just want to do transactions with him, you can tell him what you need. But if you're smart, actually, you'll call him in to help you think about, you know, what you need. So, um, so there's a super, it's a super complementary, or it can be the traditional strategic approach, which focuses on um, competitors, markets, and as well as uh, you know our internal assets and resources. Um, complementing that with actually the question of why, you know, what people are trying to accomplish when they use our products, you know, what what needs they're trying to address. I mean, th there is no competition between the two. Um, so under the right circumstances, strategists are, you know, they're all, they are very smart, the guys that I know, and they can recognize the value that brings. Um, and it's, a, it's been a super successful collaboration between this kind of an approach and the classical strategy, which is done in Swisscom. Primarily two. One is the stuff um, that we and now I with some contract help um, create in um, in sort of primary field research projects. So, um, and that's where when we're, when the goal is to find not incremental growth opportunities or, um, but to find sort of, you know, more radical or more disruptive ones, that's often what triggers these primary research studies, period. That's one data set that's, one of the data sets and the second is something that you'll um uh, that's very close to what the institute for the future calls signal gathering um and that's um and those are and that's not sort of a, a blanket monitoring which which i do it can't be but around specific topics where i think um wh where the need for making sense is acute for Swisscom, where the relevance is high and where the uncertainty, unclarity about what's going on is high, then um, I've started, I piloted this a couple of years ago, and now this year I've, I've started doing it in a, in a way that I can communicate um, and use in, in workshops. I've started collecting data sets, sets of signals, um, just, you know, quality, you know, examples, uh, what the IFTF calls signals, basically that are that are indicating some, you know, an underlying change, and then, you know, looking for patterns in those, clustering those, putting those together uh, in ways that can, you know, trigger the move from sort of what's going on to what does that mean for us to what are we going to do about it. So um, the data set. So those are the two primary the two data sets um, that I'm using that are being useful for um, shaping um, <clears throat> for three things shaping the the way that um, enriching the content 
uh, of the topics that strategists are looking at. So complementing their classical approach with a bunch of stuff about actually why the cu- who the customer is, not who, but you know what the customer is trying to accomplish and how that's in um, in flux, how that's changing. Um, secondly, um, with those data, those based on those kind of data sets. Um, uh, I'm, I'm having an influence on the topics the strategists are looking at. So um, sort of content on two levels. And thirdly, also me- in terms of method and the way we're doing it. Um, right now we're doing a, a, a growth uh, project. Um, uh, yeah, growth strategy project. And um, we're doing two parallel tracks. So, so one is the sort of the classical approach for finding new gro- new areas of growth uh, for the firm, and a second one is a purely um, uh, you know behavioral need based uh, way for look for discovering new areas for growth. So, um, so those are the yeah th- those are the, the those are the the primary data sets that I'm using. I've described some of the, the you know, skills that I, you know, have to sort of put them together and communicate them. And that's the, um, those I think are, those are the, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of impact within strategy that I'm getting. Some of that is just in a, <clears throat> you know, responding to the, the tab, you know, the, the areas, the, the topics that they have, sort of enriching that with an additional perspective. Secondly, driving certain topics you know, or shaping their decision on what to look at um, to the extent that we can. So when you're reporting to, you know, to the board of directors and to the executive, um, you know, committee, then there's a lot, you know, some, some, you can tell them what they should think sometimes. And a lot of times you just look at the questions they've got. And then the third, which I think is maybe, uh, it might be the most transformative if that ends up and you know, being successful is in helping them think about what the, you know, and helping them do their job in a, in a you know, in a, in a little bit of a different way, or sort of adding other perspectives to the way they do their their job classically. But one of the things that has that I'm absolutely convinced of, and it's the most fundamental difference between um, I, I call them business audiences. It might be applied audiences generally, but I don't know any other applied audiences very well between business audiences and academic audiences, um, in my, my experience of academic audiences. And for them, the most important question or the primary question, the first question is, how do you know what you know? Once you've demonstrated that to a group of anthropologists, say, that you have acquired knowledge in a legitimate way, then you can tell them almost anything Thing, no matter how unbelievable, wild, spectacular, exotic it is, and they'll accept it. Business audiences, they don't give a shit how you know what you know. They want to know what you know. And if they're convinced, if it's relevant, if it meets their need, they, you never get a question about how do you know that. So it's when you're either not relevant enough or you've been sloppy in your communication, in your preparation, um, that the questions come, oh, you know, that the question, now wh- how, now why have you, you know, that the questions come, or the, that it becomes difficult to convince them. So um, <clears throat> that's been my experience. I, I remember when I worked in the team, there was a, a, a generally a different approach to communication taken, and that was one of the things that somehow took up a lot of time in meetings. Well, how do you guys know what you know? Um, and then, but then, um, that just hasn't, honestly, that hasn't been in the last six or seven years that just hasn't been a, um, it hasn't been a topic which has come up very much. Um, and I think partly, um, part of the sort of the way that I've chosen to work and that is to invest extremely heavily in finding, um, so I actually, I called it pre-sales in our team. So to find internal customers who need answers to their questions before we invest in any kind of a research, because when you've, um, so, and, and that's been key that, you know, when you're, um, it's, it's also very different, um, 
it, it sets your audience up in a very different way. You know, if I'm coming to, back to you and say, hey, Jan, I've got I think I've got some answers or some insights to the questions that we talked about, you know, two months ago that are, you know, that are priorities for you. Um, it's very different from going to an audience saying, my name's Tom. I've got some stuff here I think is pretty interesting. I hope you find it interesting, too. We did a lot of number two when I was working in the team, and we've done none of that since I've been in charge. We've done what I called lots and lots of pre-sales work, and then, of course, and lots and lots of after-sales work, because I, I believe that, that I get paid not to produce interesting stuff, but actually to produce changes in the firm. And so that requires, you've got to get your hands dirty. There's just, it's, there's no other way. So that, um, I think that's a long, but so I'm not saying that, hey, everybody just lies down and says, that's a great, I got it, I got it, I got it. Um, but I think that when you prepare, when the research is done, when, when the research is done carefully, when you're actually answering the kind of questions that you can, um, and even more importantly, but that's just sort of basic hygiene of a researcher, but even more importantly, when you're answering the questions that are challenges for your internal customers, you know, when you've taken the time to actually understand them, help them understand what they need, formulate a way to get what they need, then it's just, it doesn't come up. How do you know what you know? It doesn't come up. For me, it hasn't come up in the last, in the last bunch of years. I mean, it's a pain in the ass when it, you know when it does um but i, I think that that that's that's probably th th those are most the two most important keys because you know I, it's not like i'm your most i'm a super charismatic guy i'm not like a super persuasive guy i'm not a you know those aren't my strengths so um but i think those are keys in terms of getting um in terms of getting yeah they are i mean they absolutely are in terms of getting the, the results accepted for the, the to whatever level of, of reliability and certainty that they actually genuinely have yeah that was we when I'm talking about the last sort of seven or eight years at Swisscom that's we uh, that's we that that refers to other people in my team so um, now for the last 12 months or so um, I've, I've given up the lead of that team and in order to focus you know, in order to mix more strongly sort of the, the, the future of customers um, with the needs of strategy. So and um, so right now, when I talk about we right now, I have no idea what that means. It's just me in terms of creating, you know, in terms of it's just me. Everybody else is a customer to me. Everybody else in the firm is a customer to me. There isn't really anybody right, you know, right now that I'm. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to human insights that I'm putting stuff together with. Of course, I work with the strategy now, so I work on projects with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Man, I had an interview just two weeks ago, which blew my mind. Oh, it was killing me. I had somebody at the end of the interview, I was looking at um, the financial the financial settlement part of divorce of divorce process. So that's about all I can tell you about that. But I was looking at for sort of the financial part. You know, there are a bunch of different things that you're are being achieved or, you know, are goals in a in a in a divorce. But one of them is a financial settlement. So I was looking at that part, and I had people, and I said, I don't, you know, any, you know, I I, I go through the normal. Um, the normal protections, you know, the normal explanations, the normal protections, which for me are critical. Um, but then I, you know, but I, you know, I said some extra things like I'm not here to collect personal information, intimate in information. I don't want, you know, I don't want it. I don't want it, you know. Um, and in two, and in two of the four interviews, and one in particular, then at the end, you know, basically I'm wrapping it up and saying thanks. You know, it's great. You know, really appreciate it. Hang on, there's one other thing I have to tell you. And then comes all this stuff out about, uh, you know, I'm in this sort of abusive relationship and I got this going on and this, you know, and my kids have been kidnapped. And I'm like, not prepared for that. 
not prepared. So there are the issues that are directly related to the research, and then, then there are the, the ethical issues that just pop up, and you're like, oh. Um, so in category number two, uh, uh, I wasn't prepared for that. I'm not prepared for that, actually. My, my research has been dominated by workplace research, so um, I, I, I wasn't, you know, I'm not very well prepared for the ethical, for the surprise ethical issues. Um, the, the stuff that we've, um, but the ones related to the research, um, <clears throat> the biggest ethical issues actually have been vis-a-vis -vis the firm. So people within our company saying, I want the raw data. I want to see more, you know, give me the transcripts, give me your notes, stuff like that. That's been the main one because um, most of the topics have not been. Um, that's been the main one. Actually, we have gone into households. You know, so there's there's there are chances to see all sorts of intimate and private stuff. Um, so most of that has been handled. Um, so most of that runs along the honesty and integrity of the individual uh, uh, researcher. Um, and, and for me, um, um, uh, you know, I've uh, um, any sort of research on human subjects means that the priority one has to be that the experience is, is good and positive for the person. And then your second priority is the quality of your information. Um, and part of that experience has um, means you have to follow through on, you have to obey the, what, you know, we all assign sort of a confidentiality agreement. And part of the ethics of human research, in my opinion, is holding that agreement even if the participant doesn't know that you w would break it it's holding it now it's just about tom's personal ethic now um and but that's been the so that's something i very carefully explain to people in every single research setting you know with some of these very words um and to say we can stop at any moment you know we can always stop and blah 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 and where the information will go and where it won't go and in what form and i think that the biggest there have been very, very, you know, a review board would say, no, you can't look at that topic or you can't look at it in that way. I don't think we or I have been anywhere really close to those kind of questions. The biggest challenge for me has been people saying uh, within the firm saying, I want to get <clears throat> closer to the data or I want the data. And part of our agreement with people is that they won't have the date, you know, the, the layer of data, which is ident which makes them identifiable, that, identifiable, that nobody outside the project team will have that. Actually, nobody outside the individual researcher will have that access to that data. So that's probably been the biggest, um, you know, ethical challenge, you know, explaining to people why you're not giving them what they, you know, what they want. First thing is uh, for people who are thinking about that is do it. It's fun. It's great. I love it. Um, I like um, I like seeing um, um, what is that in English? Um, seeing the effect of the stuff that I learn. You know, I like seeing the the effects on the organization, on the products or on their the interactions, the process that they set up, the strategy, especially. I like seeing the effects. I like seeing it change something in real life. You know, <clears throat> for me, I like I like to I like generating new knowledge, absolutely. Um, but for me, I like the 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 transfer of knowledge even more than generating new knowledge. And, and maybe that's something that, um, I, probably that's something that, you know, if you're sitting there, if someone's sitting there in your workshop and saying, I really like generating new knowledge, probably an applied career isn't the right one for you. Probably an academic career is. Um, if you're someone who says, I really like the transfer, then, um, a business doing this in business is going to give you a hell of a lot of time transferring knowledge. So we, we just, we end up having with this kind of a background, both an academic and a, and a human research background, you, you've got at least, you've got access to at least two different sources of, of, of insight, of knowledge that, that a lot of people in the firm don't have. You know, one is just, you know, fluency in 
sifting through academic stuff um, and seeing to what it to what uh, how far you can extend that sort of theory or those insights into other areas and the second of course then is the direct contact that we have with the human beings that we study so um, so if you like you know the knowledge transfer then do it because it's um, but but the transfer you won't get you certainly won't be paid in a business environment just to get smarter you'll be you know you're paid to make changes you know in the in the firm in the way that it works that the you know that will affect bottom line type stuff so that that i would say um and it's also it there there it's a fun it's an environment which is challenging in many 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 different ways so um uh will require you know different broad you know skill sets um, social competence, uh, communications competence, research competence. Um, um, so depending on you know on, on what kind of a firm or what kind of a field, lot, it could be lots of sort of social inter you know interaction competence. You may be in multi, like we are here, multilingual, multicultural firms. I mean it's very very fun. So, but somehow. The buzz has to be also in that challenge, you know. Um, it can't, you know, and that's that's also something maybe um, that's true. If, if you, you know, if it hurts to throw away good ideas and good insights, then a business career is not the right one, because you're gonna sort of throw away an awful lot of them. A few will get through, you know, depending on how hard you push. <laughs> A few you can get a few through, but there's just lots and lots of stuff that you'll just have to somehow say, you know, say goodbye to. So if the, so if that robs you of energy, then it's probably a bad location. If if the challenge, the challenge of you know of bringing that into, into um, um, you know structures and processes, um, areas of the, of the firm that have the sort of inertia you know, based on success hopefully if that challenge gives you energy then it's then then do it in this position i've been able to answer certain questions about the discipline which were interesting to me right at the beginning even though i knew people could do i knew anthropology was useful for doing product development i still wondered can i take what i learned in my phd totally different research setting um <clears throat> and apply that here and create value here it's very different when you're doing research, for example, with people who have a lot more power than you do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I was able to answer that question. And then the second question was, can I take the skills and experience and background I have in anthropology and in other areas, but in anthropology now, and, and create value, um, not just, at the, like I said earlier, not just at the product service level, but at the strategic level. Is that possible? You know, it was sort of an in, uh, intellectual curiosity something related to the discipline um and so i've had a chance to answer that question so you know there's been lots of um it's given me a chance to do to answer questions of course about myself but also some questions some interesting questions i think about the discipline so so it's it's, it's very fun it's been very fun mm -hmm.